Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to Christ Fellowship Church. We have gathered this morning to worship God, and uh, that means we need to take a few moments and kind of set aside the things that have consumed our thoughts for the week, even this morning, uh, in getting here uh, to, to worship God. We want to just set those things aside, uh, clear our minds, so to speak, so that we can give our focus and our attention to the Word of God, which has power. We have gathered to receive power from the Word of God, ministered to us by the Holy Spirit and by the hearing of the Word. What a wonderful opportunity. What a grand opportunity. And so uh, Bob Spencer's going to come. Bob is going to read our call to worship this morning. Bob. Good morning. Good morning. The call to worship, the call to worship is from Psalm 33, verses 1 to 5. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Lord, we gather once again to praise you this morning, to remember your goodness, your mercy, your grace, your steadfast love and faithfulness. You are the upright one, the source of all justice, the fountain of righteousness. Receive our praises and nourish us with your truth this morning. We pray all this in the name of the Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join together in singing. Our 
Our voices unite and recount your praise again and again. You are our song from age to age. Your power to save again and again. Amen. Creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, oh, praise Him. take a minute now to think about our past week and the ways we've sinned, the ways we've fallen short, the ways we have not loved God as we should, have not loved our fellow, fellow uh, believers as ourselves. So let's do that for a minute, and then after that, I'll pray. Oh, Lord, thank you for forgiveness. 
You have delivered us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of your beloved son, Jesus, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Help us now to walk in holiness. Amen. Amen. Father, we sing those words in spirit and in truth. Beneath the cross of Jesus, we find a place to stand. What mercy that you would show us sinners in every way, uh, love and compassion and forgiveness. We thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ, and we worship you for what you've done through him. pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you, guys. Well, good morning and welcome once again. If you're with us for the first time, we're so glad to have you here this morning. I want to make you aware of just a couple of things in one of the chairs in front of you. You'll find one of these Connect cards. Uh, we hope that you would use that to connect with us. Uh, we would be happy to answer questions about Christ Fellowship Church, about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's room on the back for prayer requests. And if we can pray for you, we'd be honored to do that. After the service, you can just slip that Connect card in that that little wooden box on the back wall, it's where our members place their tithes and offerings, but you can just slip that Connect card in there and we'd be happy to follow up in any way that you'd like for us to. Well, we want to uh, take a minute to thank the Lord for the ways that he's been with us this past week. On Wednesday, we had our prayer gathering and Eric led us in prayer for just praising the, the Lord of creation, uh, the God who's given us life and who has made everything and gives us a new life in Christ. And so we pray that we would continue to be good and faithful worshipers of him. On Friday, our ladies' fellowship gathered in their study of 2 Peter and landed on the, on the idea that uh, we have confidence in Christ to preserve us unto the end. Saving faith always perseveres uh, because faith in Christ, Christ is the one who perseveres. And so wonderful, wonderful assurances that our ladies grasped 
on Friday night that we pray the Lord would continue to build into them. Coming up this week, well, this is our last home fellowship week for the season. Uh, Home fellowships are a great way uh, where we get to know one another uh, from kind of the school year. We take summers off, so we'll pick back up again in the fall, but uh, praying that the Lord would use this final one to knit our hearts together again in prayer and in caring for one another. And uh, remember your home fellowship groups, even even though you're not meeting in the summer, to to pray for and care for one another uh, as you go through the summer months and we rejoin those in the fall. Uh, today uh, is, a, is a bit of a fun day. Immediately after uh, the worship service, we'll have our spring cookout. And uh, so I'll, uh, when we, uh, immediately after the service, uh, downstairs where all the food is, uh, you know, we'll kind of go down there. Uh, be, be aware, and uh, if you can keep your kids close, the men will be moving some chairs around. Uh, we may need to bring a few chairs from up here down there. There'll be an overflow table up here, but mostly we'll be situated downstairs. And uh, we'll pray for the meal a little bit later. So right now, what I want you to do is completely forget that there's food in the building. (laughs) Just set that aside. It'll be there when you're ready for it uh, as we continue to move on in worshiping the Lord. Well, this morning, I wanted to take a little bit of time in uh, in sharing and praying. But I wanted to to give first opportunity to the Woolbrants. This is Zach and Hope's last Sunday with us. And uh, Zach, would you mind coming up here just for a minute? Hope, is that Maxton over there? Welcome, Maxton, to Christ Fellowship Church. His first Sunday. (laughs) Come on up. I didn't tell you about this. Well, that wouldn't be any fun. (laughs) But, uh, you know, the Woolbrants have been with us four years? Yeah, I have. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, they have just served in so many wonderful ways. Uh, Zach's been sort of an auxiliary staff member for us. He's... uh, He's uh, obviously led our worship in playing and singing, and uh, we've benefited greatly from that. He's also led our young adult ministry uh, for the last couple of years, and so we've benefited from that. Uh, together, Zach and Hope serve in the children's ministry, and, uh, and they've just been a lot of fun uh, to have around and, uh, and good friends to have. And so I just, wanted to, I just wanted to take a moment and thank them. I know that you want to thank them, too, for all that they've done to serve Christ Fellowship Church. I want to give you this just uh, a little token of our appreciation and our love for you as, uh, as they move off into Massachusetts. I'm sorry for that. You have to go to Massachusetts. Uh, but, but it's to continue Zach's dental career. And uh, so we'll be praying for you that things go well and that the Lord use you mightily in that place. And we just want to give you this. Is, so this is a little book called Piercing Heaven. It's, uh, it's a compilation of prayers from the Puritans, the English Puritans, and uh, just a little token uh, of our love for you. So thank you, brother. Thank you. You bet. Love you guys. Yeah, I said I'd give you first shot at uh, at uh, at parent share, so you know you guys go ahead and go first if there's anything you'd like to say. Yeah, I just uh, kind of been thinking about if I had the opportunity to share a little bit about uh, our time here. Just not really. We can't really describe our our time with our our children and with our fellowship and uh, family that we that we've been able to um, enjoy growing together spending under the teaching of the word has grown my faith here at Fellowship and I I do enjoy that. I brought you guys this morning to um, teach me from the pulpit and learn about your word. Um, I've been kind of telling people, you know, it's obviously bittersweet. It's sad that we're leaving. We're very sad that we're leaving. Um, I'm going to miss you guys, but to try and put a positive spin on it, I think just to say, you know, we trust the Lord. We'll bless his name and and we'll say goodbye in heaven and we're going to, we're moving on. But I like to say we're, we're not leaving Christ Fellowship per se. We're bringing over part of Christ Fellowship to where we're going to be. We're going to, you know, the times that we've had here, the opportunity we've had to grow, um, you know, Christ is not lost. It's going to be used in our lives and in the lives of those that we're around wherever we're at. So um, we, we love you guys. We're going to miss you guys so much. And, um, you know, we'll be back. Saying thanks for coming out today. So thank you, and then of course I'll go to the um, thanks team and finish the prayer. Amen. 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 Well, we have just a little bit of time left for a few more, a few more sharings that we can pray about. Who else would like to share this morning? Yeah, Jason. I 
I'm sorry, can you say his name for me one more time? Yeah. Thank you, Jason. What else would you like to share? Well, let me share this, and then I'll pray. Uh, but uh, I think I put in the email this week that uh, the Lord has answered more of our prayers for baby girl Lane, uh, that uh, the hygrama is gone, uh, according to the latest ultrasound. And so we praise God for that. Uh, again, we're not out of the woods yet. We're, we're praying for this baby's health. Uh, we're praying for this baby's complete formation in the womb and a, and a healthy and safe delivery for Lydia. And so we want to continue to pray for them. Well, let's bow our heads now, and I want to pray uh, for these things. And uh, together, at the end, we will pray the words that the Lord taught us to pray. That Lord's Prayer is published in your bulletin that you have in front of you. Heavenly Father, we come to you with great thanksgiving. Uh, we thank you for Zach and Hope and Malachi and Maxton. Uh, what, a, what a sweet, uh, sweet time we've had with them while they've been here. And, uh, and Lord, we, we pray uh, that you would continue to bless them. Uh, Lord, that you would continue to uh, grow them in faith. Father, that you would continue to use them in service to yourself and to your church. We pray that they would quickly find and assimilate into a gospel-preaching church where they're going. And Lord, that you would use them there and that that church would come to love them as we have come to love them. We thank, them that, uh, thank you that uh, they, have, they have fulfilled their membership vows. Uh, they, have, they have been with us and helped us to build one another up in love. And so, Father, we ask that you would bless them and carry them forward in your service and into your kingdom. Father, we thank you that when we pray, we tell ourselves that you hear because the Bible says that you hear. We love it when you answer. And the, the Bible says you'll answer. That as we would ask and seek and knock, we would, we would be heard and you would respond. And Father, we just praise you for your, your health-giving response to baby girl Lane. Uh, Lord, that you would continue to develop this baby uh, in Lydia's womb and, and bring her to, to life, Father, in full health, we ask this. We pray that uh, in the meantime, during the pregnancy, Lord, that you would bring peace and comfort uh, to Lydia and to Parker. Uh, Father, that they would not worry day by day, but that they would trust you day by day, knowing that they will receive what comes from your good hand. Father, we ask to, that you would extend a healing hand to Jason's stepfather and Lord, struggling with cancer and a stroke, that's a lot. And he needs your healing touch, but more, Father. He needs salvation in Christ. He needs to be saved from his sins. And so, Lord, we pray that you would bring the gospel word to him and that you might grant him saving faith, that he would, that he would drop to his knees and repent of his sins and turn to Christ and find what is true and everlasting life in him. Father, we pray that you would bless us as we continue to learn about you in the creation account in Genesis, praying that you would fortify our faith, that you would place us up high on a sound rock, a foundation of your creation ordinances and truths that we might stand firm in this place, that we might be worshipers of you, and that we might be proclaimers of your excellencies towards us in the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the things we ask. These are the things we pray. And we pray that you might move, that you might grant us your spirit and grow us in these ways. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, kids, uh, I'm sorry, I missed the Lord's Prayer, didn't I? Caught it just like that. That's okay. There's a little break there. We take a breath, and, uh, and let's go ahead and pray those words that the Lord taught us to pray. Remember, uh, we're not just reciting these words. Um, it's kind of why I read them painfully slow. It's so that we can think about the words as we pray them and join our hearts together in prayer. Let's do that. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Now, kids, second through sixth grade, you're dismissed to go downstairs with your teachers.
Everyone else, if you would take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 1. If you need a Bible, please stay right where you are. Just hold your hand up and Ron will bring you a Bible so that we can read along together. Let me just go ahead and uh, beg your indulgence. It's, uh, it's allergy season for me in the spring, so there may be a few sniffles along the way. Don't laugh, don't laugh too loud if my voice cracks. It's embarrassing. Well, I want to begin this morning by reading from the creation account, keeping in mind that as much as this is about creation, it is even more profoundly about God, the creator. I'll be reading Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 27. We'll be focusing on verses 6 to 25, which is the second day through the beginning of the sixth day of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule by the day, the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God said to them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and living creature, every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, Livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And the livestock according to their kinds. And everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Well, in our look at day one last week... We learned several things about God himself, things that strengthen our faith in him, things about him that should bolster our resolve to live according to his word. In day one, God created the light, and, and he does these things. There are these action verbs that God is doing. God speaks his powerful word. He calls forth light, and there was light. He sees and assigns it value. God declares that the light is good. 
God separates and assigns everything its place. God separates the light from the dark. You go here and you go there. And God names these things because he understands what they are and he has the authority to do so. God calls the light day and the night or the darkness night. And we talked about the glory of the light of God who who himself dwells in inaccessible light. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And so we pick up on day two. And verse 6, and God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters, and it was so. What we have seen, what we have so far then is, is this big, deep, swirling kind of sphere of water. It's referred to as the deep. It's referred to as the waters, and the Holy Spirit is hovering over it, attentively and intensely over it, and God takes some of the watery stuff, and he pushes it down, and he takes more of the watery stuff, and he pushes it up, so there's a space in between. So there's this space in between these two globs of watery stuff, and the space is the thing that God made, the expanse. That's kind of a, it's kind of a cross-cut view, because it Uh, You probably read it and you go, okay, there's this down here and there's that up there and then there's the expanse in the middle, but that's a cross cut. We're not flat earthers, it's a sphere, but we've got a cross cut view of it. And then God creates this expanse and he names it heaven. Now remember, we talked about the use of the word heaven in Genesis. Your Bible may have a note that says this word can be translated sky. We refer to it daily as our atmosphere. That's what we call it. Now, let's think for a moment. Have you ever tried to move water? <laughs> I'm just, just going to go move this water. You know, have you ever gone to the beach and walked out in the Atlantic and tried to hold back just one of the waves coming in? How did you do? Were you successful? I mean, have you ever seen... Hoover Dam or pictures of Hoover Dam or watched a documentary on the construction of Hoover Dam, do you see what it takes, all of the genius and mechanic mechanisms of man, just to hold back one little river in one canyon? It's, it's, it's a wonder. So how did God do it? How did God separate this massive abyss of water He spoke a word. That is the amazing, unfathomable power of the word of God. And what did he put in between the waters to keep them separate? Air. Air. More than air, I suppose. This breathable, inhabitable atmosphere that he has created. That's the creative power of the word of God. Listen to how the Psalms sing of God's might in Psalm 104, verse 3. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. What a picture of God's mastery over this atmosphere that he's created. God's act of creation on the second day reveals to us the power of God, but also the goodness of God. I think this is often overlooked, but I've, I've probably read further ahead in the book of Genesis than you have, so I'll just bring your attention to it. And at the time of the flood in Genesis chapter 7, God releases the waters that were above the earth and the waters that were below the earth. Because you're kind of wondering, what, what did he do with that up there in the canopy? So we have this, this original creation of space, but in a moment of judgment... God suddenly takes it away. Suddenly there's this catastrophic flood that covers all the earth. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came upon the earth. And on that day, the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were opened. That act of God's judgment, Peter says, changed the atmosphere of the earth forever. In 2 Peter chapter 3. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago And the earth was formed out of the water. You can hear he's talking about Genesis, right? The earth was formed out of the water and through the water by the word of God and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. 
But by the same world, word, excuse me, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. That is a reminder to us. That is a reminder to us to, to, to not go against God. You do not undermine the creation ordinances of God. You do not turn away from worshiping God without him noticing and eventually bringing judgment. See, the atmosphere is part of God's goodness. It was the only barrier that kept his watery judgment from falling upon the ancient world. But the time came when God took away that barrier to his judgment. We move freely, don't we? We move freely through this atmosphere that God named. Not even thinking about taking a breath. Are, are, you, are you thinking about your breaths right now? Every breath we take should remind us of the goodness of God. And what, what should you do with your breath? Should you use it for your own purposes? Should you use it to exalt your name? Or to exalt him? And to commune with him. Scripture says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let's look at day three. On the third day, God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Now, I can already tell that my emotive reading of the phrase, and it was so, is having less and less impact on you as we go along. Like, yes, God, we get it. God has power in creation. Yes, but, but you need to see that God did not run out of power on day one. You need to see that God's power wasn't less on day two. You need to see that God has power on day one, and God has power on day two, and God has power and you need to see that the word of God is God. And so the word of God in Genesis is not weakened by the time we get to Revelation. The word of God is always powerful. And if we take the power of the word of God for granted, we will miss being formed and filled by it. Look at the awesome power of the Word of God. God says, okay, you waters over there. (laughs) Is that what you imagine in in your mind? Whatever the sound the movies make that that is just thunderous waters moving. (laughs) Waves are crashing against waves to get where they're supposed to be. Tsunamis and storm surges and rogue waves are nothing compared to this. And then he says, okay, dry land up here. Rumble. As the rocks come up from the water. Earthquakes and tectonic shifts are nothing compared to this. We can't begin to imagine the massive power at work. Not just moving dry land, but bringing it into being. Julie and I bought a a few shrubs to plant in front of the house. And, you know, I thought that the planting would be done in a few days. It's been a few weeks. Um, And I don't know if you experience this or not, but when I put the spade in the dirt and I jump on it with all of my crushing weight, the dirt pushes back. It says, no, Scott, no further. I mean, I'm exhausted just trying to move a few cubic feet of dirt. God made the globe, the land, and the sea as we conceive of it in one day by the power of his word. And God saw that it was good. Listen to how scripture reflects on the word of God's power on the third day. Job, in Job 38, the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? By the way, you don't, you don't want to hear God talking to you sarcastically, okay? Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from its womb, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, 
and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far you shall come and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. So where were you when God did that? Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deep in its storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. (laughs) Don't complain about the weather. Just be thankful and be in awe of God. Psalm 104. He set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they took flight. The mountains rose, the valleys sank to the place where you appointed them. Do you hear the will of God? Accomplished by the power of God through the word of God? Do you? It's there for us. And what is the will of God here? Why does he create dry land? So that someone will have a place to put their feet. See, something else happens on the third day. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation. And it was so. Don't you love that? Wouldn't you, be a, wouldn't you love to garden like that? Don't you love it when spring finally comes? And the crocuses pop up and the daffodils burst out. Don't you love it when the trees blossom and, and leaf out? And I'm, I'm just so thankful for the pollen right now. So grateful that God provided it. There's no reason to complain, right? It's from his hand and everything turns green. And everything bursts out in bright warm colors. And it's not just for decoration, but for food, for sustenance. It's it's all horticultural and agricultural and aquacultural. Don't forget the seaweed. See, the dry land isn't just rock and dust. God covers it with self-replicating vegetation, right? It's going to grow, and it's going to grow more, and it's going to grow more. Each plant produces a seed that produces more of that plant. And each fruit bears seed that produces more of the trees that produce that fruit. Each according to its kind on the earth. And God saw that it was good. So on day three, God said it was good twice. So so take a step back for a second. And see what happened on day three that's so good. What began as formless and without shape is now formed and shaped, right? Able to sustain life, able to nourish life. And exactly what is it that God has built? I mean, God knew that when he said, let there be light, there'd be light, right? He knew that that was what would happen. And he knew that the expanse would be next. And he planned for the earth to be land and sea and sky above. See, God has a blueprint in his mind for what he is building. So what is it that God has built? A temple. A temple. God has made the whole world his temple. God has formed it, and he will fill it. In fact, the Spirit of God already fills the temple, right? He dwells in every square inch of the world that God has created. Now, many of you have studied or read or heard a podcast saying that the Garden of Eden is is a temple, and that's right. The entire entire cosmos is, is this. And when this temple's wrecked, see, you're going you're gonna to read on in Scripture and find in its place the tabernacle. And then after a period of time, you're going to find in its place the Jerusalem temple. And then in time, you're going to find in its place the new Jerusalem coming down from above in Revelation. 
and all that's true, but there is a sense right here in which the whole world is the temple that God built for himself and for his worshipers. The entire cosmos is the place where God himself will commune with his creatures, most particularly with his people. So the purpose of the whole world was for everything in it. That's a little clever reference to the sermon title. The purpose of the whole world was so that everything in it to commune with God and to enjoy God and to, and to praise Him and to glorify God forever. And even before we get to mankind, which, which we won't today, it'll be next Sunday, before we get to mankind, God fills the world with all kinds of amazing, wonderful creatures. So we see what God is doing in the six days of creation. And what he means when he says that it's good. It's good and it's beautiful and he assigns it value because it is his temple and it serves his glory. And God is revealing things about himself in the building of his temple. And in his creating and giving life to his creatures and his goal to dwell with them and commune with them and their purpose to glorify God and enjoy him forever. We recognize these truths in his ordering of the six days of creation. The first three days, he gave form to what was formless, and in the next three days, he's going to fill that which was empty. So look at day four. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the, high, the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. See, this expanse of the heavens is what we refer to as our solar system. It's, it's, it's outer space, right? Where no man has gone before, in a galaxy far, far away, where the, where the guardians of the galaxy do their galaxy guarding. Yeah, I told you about uh, my Microsoft screensaver on my, new, on my new laptop, right? It pops up new pictures all the time. And uh, I, I, like, I like the big vistas of, you know, prairie, lake, hills, mountain, sky. I like those. And uh, I'm, I'm, so you have this choice, I like it or not my thing, and, or not a fan. And so when, when the pictures pop up, I'm, I'm clicking, yeah, I like these vistas because I want to keep getting those vistas. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this week when I'm studying uh, creation, uh, a picture of the Andromeda galaxy pops up. And I'm like, I don't want to look at that. I want green grass and fields. And I, and I start to hit not a fan, and I stopped. I was like, wait a minute. Look at, look at the stars. Look at what God created in the Andromeda galaxy. And so I didn't hit not a fan, but I also didn't hit, hit I like it, because I didn't want to be in, you know, in flooded with, with star pictures, because I want to get back to the vistas sooner or later. But I thought, it just popped up, and I thought, that's amazing. That's so far away, I can't see it. And it's billions of stars in its own right. On day one, God made light. On day four, God makes these heavenly luminaries. That's my favorite word for them. The heavenly luminaries. Uh, they're, they're heavenly beings. They're not living beings. They're heavenly beings. Uh, functionally, they are light bearers. God created these light bearers. They bear the light that God created to the earth. According to a quick Google search, the sun is 93 million miles away from us right now. And it takes eight minutes for the light to get from the sun to the earth. Eight minutes. I mean, if you flipped a switch in your home and had to wait eight minutes for the light to come on, you'd already be on the phone to CMP, right? Eight minutes. 93 million miles. That's a long way. But you know what? You wouldn't dare stare at the sun with the naked eye, would you? You know what? If you go out to the beach and you stay in the sun too long, what will it do to your skin? It will burn your skin. 
The sun is so loaded with nuclear power that we can't even approach it. What about God? What about God? Is the sun too powerful for God to touch? He takes it and he places it precisely where he wants it. Where he wants it to serve him and to serve life on earth. And God creates the moon to work in tandem with the sun. So that as as the earth spins on its axis, you see, the sun carries the greater light in the daytime and the moon reflects the lesser light of the nighttime. They, they, so the sun doesn't go off and turn back on. It just goes around the other side of the earth. I don't know if you, you thought about it. So it's always shining, and the moon's always reflecting. But it's telling us about the times. So they give light upon the earth. And God assigns the heavenly beings another task. They're to be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. What does that mean, that they're to be for signs? Does that mean your astrological sign? No. But isn't that what astrology and astrologers use them for? Yes, but you're not to do that. Deuteronomy chapter 18. You're not to look to stars for information about your future. You're to look to God and trust him for your future. So if you're planning to read your horoscope in the Sunday paper, repent. Don't even open that page of your paper. The celestial bodies serve as signs of earth's times. They set the clock for the seasons that come and go and come again. They measure the seasons by days and months and years. In Matthew chapter 16, you remember that Jesus acknowledges the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They can tell from the condition of the skies what kind of weather they're going to have today, right? Red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky at morning, sailors take warning. So there are some atmospheric signs or conditions, but Jesus certainly doesn't call them zodiac signs. And because the stars are fixed in their courses, they can be used for navigation on land and on sea. They're a fixed part of the creation. I want to make two points here about the sun, moon, and the stars. The first begins with Moses' first readers. Remember that the Pentateuch is delivered to the nation of uh, Israel, to Joshua and them on the Jordan's stormy banks as they prepare to enter the promised land to fight the people bigger than them to receive what God has promised them. And the question is not, are their warriors bigger than our warriors? That's That's what the first generation in the wilderness was afraid of. But that generation is gone after 40 years of wandering. And this generation wants to know, Are their gods bigger than our God? See, because they claim to have the God of light and a God of darkness. And they claim to have a God of earth and a God of sea and a God of the sky. And God's people read Genesis that they are no such gods at all. There is only one true God, and he is their God. And their God has created the light and the world and everything in it. See, Moses goes out of his way not to call the sun and the moon the sun and the moon. Did you notice that? He just says greater light, lesser light. See, Re was the Egyptian sun god and Marduk the Mesopotamian moon god. And they're just, they're not gods at all. They're just two material things that God made and placed where he wanted them so that they would usher light upon the earth. Brothers and sisters, think about this. We have been called to go and make disciples, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. Look at the bedrock foundations that we have in Genesis that help us. Your God is bigger than the gods out there in this world. Why? Because there are no gods at all. Oh, they reside in the halls of government, and they reside in the halls of academia, and they reside in the entertainment culture in our industry. We're entertaining ourselves to death, but they're not gods. Your God is bigger than the gods of this world that you're afraid of. 
And there are no gods at all. So don't be afraid of them. You serve your God in his temple for his glory. And you just let the chips fall where they may. The second thing is about the goodness of God and the stars you know, that the travelers have that, that get them to their destination. You see, the sun, moon, and stars map out a structure in our world. They provide a charting of space, fixed reference points. And in this way, they show that life is not aimless. God is a God of order. And life is not aimless. Life is ordered by the seasons that God has arranged. We map our lives by the days and the years that God has set in motion. Now, if you're young, you don't think about this as much as I do. But I'm aging, and I think about it a little more and more each year. I'm getting older every day and month and year, and we all are. God's creation, all of it, is moving down a timeline towards something. You and I and the world that we live in is moving towards something. So let me ask you, are you you moving towards God and the worship of God and the glory of God or away from him? On days five and six, we see the power of God on display in the creation of an incredibly complex living beings. Look at verse 20. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God said that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. You know, there was a a time years ago now uh, when on a Saturday morning, if I couldn't go trout fishing on the Caney Fork River, I would at least sit down with a cup of coffee and watch a trout fishing show on television. They had those on Saturday mornings, you know, where, where the host would take some famous football star to some great place in Wyoming or Montana where they always catch loads of fish, a mess of trout. I remember when the boys were in high school, uh, they loved to watch Shark Week. Shark Week was a, was a major annual event for us in the Terry household. Uh, you know, there's the boat, and, and it's pulling a fake baby seal. It's not a real baby seal. It's a fake baby seal uh, behind it. And, uh, you know, they've, they've got multiple boats with multiple camera angles, and there's just this black rubber thing flapping in the water, and all of a sudden, whoosh, a great white shark, you know, breaches the ocean, and just the whole body is up in the air, and it's just like, oh, that's awesome. That's incredible. You know, you can't watch enough TV shows to see all the fish and the eels and the whales and the sea creatures that God made on the fifth day. Different shapes, sizes, colors each incredibly complex living creatures. Not rock, living creatures. And all the waters are swarming with swarms of them. And birds. One of the members of our congregation sits in his yard with a book and he listens to and he observes the birds in his yard as they call back to them. I don't want to mention Bob's name. And (laughs) and another member of our congregation I won't mention Derek's name, has an uncle who actually writes birds for the Audubon, or writes books about birds for the Audubon Society. Hundreds of pictures of birds with beautiful colored feathers and all the details of each species. And in a moment, God filled the sky with swarms of birds swarming through the air. And he saw that it was good. And what did God do next? He blessed them. He blessed them. God didn't bless any of his non-living creation, did he? But God blessed the living creatures in the waters and the birds of the air. And how did he bless them? 
This is foundational. He created within them the capacity to reproduce, each according to its kind. It's God's first blessing in Scripture. He commanded them, not by volition, but by instinct, to be fruitful and to multiply so that the waters of the skies would be filled with his good creation to renown to his glory in his temple. You get that picture, right? They're testimonies to God's power and glory in his temple. And God said it was good and that there was morning and there was evening the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. Horse and oxen, sheep and goats, cute furry little woodland creatures, lions, tigers, and bears. And God, by the power of his word, gave them the same fertile capacity to reproduce each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. You see, why is it that God pushed back the waters and created the atmosphere? So he could fill it. And why did God gather the waters together in one place? So he could fill it. And why did God create the dry land? So he could fill it. He created his glorious, splendid temple so he could fill it with glorious, splendid living things. And why living things? To serve him and to worship him and to bring him delight to himself. He looks at it and says, that's awesome. What I did was awesome. To delight himself and to fill the earth with his own glory. He didn't make an empty planet for his temple. He didn't make a plain, boring, colorless, odorless, actionless, soundless world for his temple. There was no more beautiful, perfect, glorious temple ever. And we wrecked it. Not the birds, not the fish, not the living creatures on dry land, but us. God created man in his own image and he placed him in the center of his temple and we wrecked it. You know, God is eternal and he created a temple for himself to be eternal. I learned in, I think it was fifth grade, that there's no such thing as a perpetual motion machine. We all thought we could make one when the teacher challenged us, but we can't. But God created the temple with plants and trees that would replicate themselves, and birds and fish and animals that would reproduce themselves. He created for himself a perpetual temple, if you will, and we wrecked it. We ruined the temple. We vandalized it. We defaced it. It's as if we took a can of spray paint and we graffitied our names all over the top of his name. We've made God's creation ugly by putting our names on his temple, which he named for himself. It's ugly and defiled because it does not serve the purpose for which it was made. It's no longer a place for us to commune with him. Paul says in Romans that the whole creation is groaning in bondage to corruption and subject to futility under our sinful rebellion against God who created us and put us in the world to worship him. 
and we wrecked it. So, everything that God does from that point on is to restore His temple. And to restore us to our place. And to restore our communion with Him. And that's what we see Him when we read the Old Testament and, and on into the New Testament, isn't it? We see, we see Him establishing a tabernacle. And we see Him establishing a Jerusalem temple. And then in the New Testament, we see Him redeeming and restoring us in Christ. Christ Himself. Christ is the Word of God and the power of God to redeem rebels and vandals to be worshipers again and to rebuild God's holy temple and to restore our communion with our Creator. By the Word of God's power in creation, that Word of God, the power in creation, is the power of God's Word in our recreation. Same Word. The power to humble Himself to sacrifice himself on a cross in the place of his rebellious creatures. The power to not, uh, to not to separate land and sea, but to separate the power of sin and death. The power not just for vegetation to sprout from the ground, but for Christ himself to be raised from the dead. And the Holy Spirit of God is, is hovering over God's elect to grant them saving faith and forgiveness of sins and life everlasting and communion with him by the Holy Spirit's own indwelling presence. In the six days of creation, God speaks, sees, separates, and names. And when we are in Christ by faith, God speaks and declares us righteous in Christ. We're restored to what we're supposed to be. God separates us from darkness and sets us aside to be holy as he is holy. So we are restored to where we are supposed to be. God sees us in Christ and assigns us good works that he values according to his own standard so that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And God names us. God names us. God has the understanding that he has adopted us by the blood of Christ. And he has the authority to forgive our sins and name us his children. In my studying, Matthew Henry says that we need to remember that we're tenants in God's creation. I think that's a good viewpoint. It's right. But Stephen Tracy adds, we're more than tenants. We're priests and kings in God's temple. Now, given the amazing beauty and majesty of God's creation temple that we see here in Scripture, how much more wonderful will the temple restored by the grace of God in Christ be? This account we're given of creation points us forward to the new heavens and the new earth, the place of God's glorious grace in Christ. Paul in Ephesians tells us that as members of the household of God, we're being built into a holy temple of God and that Christ is our cornerstone. Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 says, as you come to him, Christ, a living stone, rejected by men but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. We will have a function in his garden, in his temple, and over the whole earth to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light, to worship him rightly. What a glorious thing Jesus has done. What a glorious thing Jesus has done. And who is it that will worship him rightly? Who is it? We've sung about them. All the redeemed, washed by his blood, come and rejoice in his great love. Oh, praise him. Christ has defeated every sin. Cast all your burdens now on him. Hallelujah. 
he shall return in power to reign. Heaven and earth will join to say, oh, praise him. Then who shall fall on bended knee? All creatures of our God and King. Oh, praise him. Hallelujah. These six days of creation are meant to drive us to Jesus, our only hope, the word of God's power, who is still today the power of God's gospel word, unending. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we fall on bended knee before you. And we declare that you are our God and the creator of all. And we thank you and we bless you for the Lord Jesus Christ who bought us back by his blood, redeemed us as worshipers of the creator God who is carrying us to glory. We thank you and praise you for him. In Christ's name, amen. It's our privilege to gather at the Lord's Supper table and to partake of this, this feast. The, the bread represents the body of Christ sacrificed on the cross for us. Uh, the, the juice represents the righteous blood of Christ poured out to cleanse us of our unrighteousness. And when we partake of this supper, when we partake of this bread and this juice together, Christ is with us. Christ is with us in spirit. And so if you're a baptized believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, even if you're just visiting with us today, if you're a baptized believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we welcome you to participate in this Lord's Supper where we remember his sin-atoning death on our behalf, whereby we receive the forgiveness of God. If you're not yet a baptized believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we would ask you to allow the elements to pass you by. But we would also ask, would you, would you think about would you think about the words you heard from God's word this morning? That though you have defaced what is important to God, that you have, though you have rejected his authority, that he offers forgiveness through the Lord Jesus Christ so that you can come into his kingdom and into his temple and serve him and reap the inheritance that he promises. We pray that you would. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke that bread and he, and he said, this represents my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Behold the body of Christ, take and eat.
on that same night with his disciples, Jesus took the cup. He said, this represents a new covenant. It's a new promise of salvation that's written in my blood, which was poured out for you on the cross. Do this in remembrance of me. Behold the blood of Christ. Take and drink. For as often as we partake of the bread and of the cup, we declare his death until he comes. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for being our creator, God. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your gifts that you give to us, by which you sustain us by your great and good provision. And Lord, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who gives life to sinners. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand and join together in singing, O Great God. you all will stay, uh, members and, and visitors and guests uh, for our uh, cookout after the service here. Remember, just a, a few minutes after the service, there'll be some tables being set up downstairs and up here, and maybe a few chairs being carried downstairs, so if you can kind of keep the stairwell clear, uh, keep, keep kids out from under feet, that would be a tremendous help. Uh, but we look forward to fellowshipping together. Let me close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your love. We are thankful that you have called us to this place to worship you. And Father, we thank you for the power of your word that saves and that builds up your most holy church. And Father, we thank you for the food that you're given to us. And we pray that you would make much of our fellowship together, that you would be in this time building us up in our most holy faith. We ask this in Christ's name and for your glory. Amen. 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 Amen.
she came and she was cooked our meal. By the way, the meal train's been, that was one of the things I thought after. I was like, man, I should have said thank you for that because that's been amazing. Yeah, good. So we're very, very thankful. Good. But he came, yeah, it did. He came and uh, cooked our meal there because he oh, wanted it to be fresh. Did and then. No, actually, no, uh, no, we told him to stay, so he ate, uh, he ate, it was great, it was really great. 